right, we shift gears as Alia mentioned. Money laundering is what we get uh, to discuss. We remember that story that has been carried on the papers this morning as pertaining to the lab that has been set by you know the offices of or the security you know offices in the country uh, biggest question as to how best they'd be able to handle lots of things you know we're talking about the angry leasing scandal that uh, was mentioned earlier on on the you know uh, with the gentleman that we hired uh, talking about crime talking about these cases of money laundering and so as we focus on this conversation what's important is we get to understand how as a country we are trying to manage this uh, we still have statistics showing that we are amongst the top most you know know countries that are actively involved in money laundering but just what informs this we have a specialist in the name of Ida uh, Gadoni who comes from a GLOSEPS a resident research fellow and strategic interest and transitional organized crimes that is quite a mouthful Ida why don't you say it how are you I'm fine thank you Linda. you've been well thank you for having me it's a pleasure to have you and so yes introduce yourself I guess I should have started by saying that <laughs> because it's quite a mouthful for me you've noticed oh, sorry. yeah uh, my name is Ida mm. Gadoni mm. I am the resident research fellow for strategic interests and transnational organized crimes <laughs> at the global center for policy and strategy uh -huh. yes um, I am I am tempted to ask just exactly what it is that you do uh, and it's huge and I have had a couple of your colleagues here and we I mean interestingly they've been handling different uh, you know different uh, quarters and so I'd love to understand just exactly what does GLOSEPS do? GLOSEPS is a think tank mm -hmm. and uh, we specialize in research that is policy oriented right yes so we have five different pillars and I believe you've met my colleague Janet she yes, handles yes, yes. Dif uh, security se no 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 <laughs> it has something diplomacy. to do diplomacy and so or, or in this case we're, we're focusing on security but yes she's more yes. on diplomacy yes, she's focusing on regional security yes, yeah. yes that's Janet then you've also had Mike on your show mm -hmm. who deals with development yeah yes uh, you will possibly over time you'll get a chance to meet our other colleagues mm. we have um, someone who handles defense and security that will be an interesting one I believe yeah and then we we also have another pillar public policy ethics and governance mm -hmm. yes all right so today we focus much on what i have mentioned money laundering and you know we just need to understand first of all an overview of the same and especially when we get to narrow it down to the country okay yeah um i think the first and the basic thing you need to understand about money laundering is it doesn't happen in isolation mm. so if you linda commit a crime and you say come across a hundred million dollars you cannot put that money directly into the system. Mm -hmm. You need to figure out a way of how to get this money into the system right. without necessarily raising getting caught and yeah. raising alarm. Yes, so that's where, that's, that t essentially is the role of money laundering. Mm -hmm. So you need to figure out a way that you bring in the money into the system and you're able to put it in a system in a way that you're able to use it. Mm. So usually how that happens is um, there's three layers when it comes to money laundering. There's a placement, there's the layering, mm -hmm. then there's the integration. Mm -hmm. So what happens is uh, usually placement and layering can be very, there's a very fine line between the two of them. So in a normal situation for placement is where you tend to purchase maybe high end um, say you have now this 100 million dollars and you decide to purchase uh, maybe a building or you purchase art or you even start a business mm -hmm. say you open like a pizza joint right then for layering comes in when you want to distance yourself from this money as far as possible okay. so that it's not very clear where this money has come from right. so whatever money you're getting from this pizza joint that you have opened you open other businesses mm -hmm. or you make other huge purchases that allow you to further and further distance yourself from the money. Mm. So in essence, this is how you're making this money legal because okay. you're making money from your pizza joint, then you've layered and invested in, say, art, you've bought high-end vehicles, you've bought um, high-rise mm. um, property. So whatever money you're getting from these properties and this, um, this new investments that you're making, you have distanced yourself from the original source of your money. Okay. Yes. So this is like uh, more or less of the damage control and, you know, in hiding of all this, right? Yes. Okay. So are they, uh, this is exactly the three steps in money laundering? Yes. All right. Those are the three steps. Those so are two steps, actually. Two steps. So integration, integration yeah. is where you're essentially able to re after you've gotten the money from now, these layered properties that mm -hmm. you have invested in, mm -hmm. now you're able to bring back the money 
into the system right. officially and now it is legal okay. in a sense <laughs> yes <laughs> well, it sounds like uh, what is happening in the country it's pretty much common today why mm. do you suppose so and why is it that there are such openings that would allow for this to play out and i agree with you uh, the other time we're just having the hashtag uh, wash wash and all that and you know you know big names have been mentioned names that uh, you know we could almost guess that their money hails from uh, this area this corner and all that so it will be hard to point a finger at them mm -hmm. and you know pull them down one why is it that this is so common and how then are we able to address that if these steps allow them to probably just balance their money you know and uh, somehow found or find the money back into their system let me start with your first question why it's very very prominent by my assessments i would say kenyans have developed a culture a very a get rich quick culture we want money mm -hmm. but we don't want to work for we don't want to work very hard for it you leave campus today tomorrow you want a bmw yeah. how do you get that bmw then there's this person who comes and tells you hey linda um i have this amount of money see let me open for you a boutique in kilimani and then whatever proceeds you you get we can split that split, yeah. yeah split that money that whole get rich cult quickly culture is one of the major contributing factors because uh, as you've mentioned there was a hashtag wash wash mm. um, hash, uh, a while back must have been mid to late yeah, last year last year yeah yes mm -hmm. and you see majority of the names that are being mentioned are very young people people who possibly haven't done their due diligence mm. in terms of uh whatever amounts or whatever wealth that they have amassed. So essentially, get rich quickly. We want money, but we don't want to work hard for it. Right. Yeah. Before it even gets to that point, uh, is the country, Kenya itself, you know, a high risk? Because when we're having um, uh, statistics show that uh, we're amongst the topmost, you know, uh, countries and nations that are hugely into money laundering, then it means even before it gets to the fact that we have a culture of, you know, uh, get rich quick, mm -hmm. then there must be a factor and an underlying factor that poses us as a you know, a country that is at high risk, why? Mm. Well, uh, there's a, a bunch of factors that expose us to this, uh, the risk of money laundering. Mm -hmm. One of the factors is within East, the East African region, we are one of the most developed, uh, we have one of the most developed financial institutions. Yeah. And now when I say financial institutions, you need to also bring in the whole aspect of mobile money which is a big problem. Mm. It's a blessing, but it's can, it has also been a big problem for money laundering. Mm -hmm. Then um, we have other issues like um, even digital finance. Mm -hmm. The whole rapid uh, development of technology has been a big thing for us, again, bringing in mobile money. Then we have proximity to our neighbors here, Somalia, which the borders make it very easy for um, smuggling yeah. charcoal sugar sometimes even human human trafficking and drug trafficking if they're coming in through there basically our location is making us vulnerable yeah mm -hmm. all right let's speak about uh diaspora remittances and uh, this is where i i base my argument from uh, they say kenya has been ranked among major money laundering jurisdictions across the globe with diaspora remittances to the country totaling to about 1.78 b and uh, that is usd so we're talking about 178 billion in the country uh, this is of course a report that comes somewhere around between january and august uh, you know 2020 and we can almost uh, tell that uh, the economy has uh, been at a standstill you know that is after covid and all that so if we have to make any analysis and we have to look at any statistics then the 2020 is one that will hugely focus on uh, some of these proceeds are suspected to be narcotics trade and all that so while we could say it could be around the country our diasporas as equally you know are, are, are equally involved as such well they actually are um I think it was, I can't remember the exact year, but there was uh, a bill that was passed, the Finance Act. Okay. And uh, within the provisions for that act, although it was repealed, I think in t uh, or the period of its existence was ended, I think in 2019, mm -hmm. one of the provisions for that uh, bill was the fact that uh, diasporans can remit their cash without any any hurdles mm. and i think that was one of the biggest issues oh. uh, when it came to money laundering because uh 
a lot of people and especially criminals you know sometimes i think we we think criminals and we mm. think these are dumb people these are actually very very smart people so they they're always the same way you're on the lookout for things like that they're also on they the lookout for ahead. things like that okay. they're on the lookout for a country that is being permissive to allow um entrance of money or within their financial system without proper regulations. Mm. So the moment that uh, act was passed, then it became a problem mm. and you could see a lot of inflow of money that is unaccounted for. Mm. So that was, um, it was, I think it was maybe a good thing, but uh, long run, it was massive oversight. Mm. And I think I could also link that to a statement that was made uh, in October by the president about um, lifting the 10,000 shilling limit. Right yeah. now in Kenya, ideally, if you have money that is over 10,000 shillings, 10,000 US dollars, you're supposed to declare it. Mm -hmm. But there's a statement he made and he said that uh, this needs to be lifted to allow uh, small businesses okay. to thrive, thrive. post-COVID. Right. But bigger picture, this has or Open it stands a big, a big, big, to bring in a big, big problem in mm -hmm. controlling money laundering. And now, speaking of which, I'd love to understand uh, how we set up mechanisms that are good enough to say that we're able to detect and investigate money laundering at early stages, like you rightfully put it, you know, you know, on research basis, uh, those are quotas that open loopholes. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes if the government sets to, to overlook the same, sometimes if we're not keen with the policies that have been set, uh, we might not be able to, to know that this is happening. But it is quite happening, and like mm -hmm. you rightfully put it, young tax are pretty much involved. So what will it take for us to be able to detect as well as investigate these processes of money laundering at early stages? Interesting in love, Linda, we have one of the best money laundering laws in the country. Mm. It's called the Proceeds of Crime and Anti-Money Laundering Act uh, of 2009. It's abbreviated as POCAMLA. So under this act, and it, it's very, very well done, but again, as you put it, the issue comes in with implementation. Um, off the top of my head, if I could pick out uh, things that are wrong with the law or some of uh, the deficiencies it has would be the penalties are pretty lenient. I think the maximum penalty for someone who's caught money within committing the crime of money laundering right. is um, 14 years in jail mm -hmm. and I think around 5 million or the value of the property with okay. which you have been caught, that is pretty lenient. Think about it in this sphere. If you have conducted some illegal business, mm -hmm. you have a, you are clean 100 million. Well, it's not clean, but okay. yeah, you have your 100 million and you're caught, but you're only required to pay I mean, very well, uh, you, not commit you, will, you will commit and say that at least I have enough to yeah. pay. Yeah. yeah, and even if you have to go to jail, you will go to jail right. for that short very period. minute short, short period mm -hmm. and then you're, you're out, out and you can enjoy your proceeds. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that is one of the issues that we're having. And then a second issue I would say is um, we have, let me say, a shortage in terms of capacity of enforcement mm. uh, because there's a report uh, should be the ODPP and their annual report keeps stating that they have a shortage of capacity for the people investigating mm -hmm. or investigators and prosecutors and then even beyond that we lack political goodwill mm. because as I said our politicians are the same ones who are involved yes <laughs> <laughs> hush hush uh, yeah. yes <laughs> yeah they're the same ones that if our legislators are the same people who are blocking legislation it's a problem mm. yeah all right if we have good policies so to speak and you know beautiful laws like you rightfully put it I guess the biggest problem would be on the aspect of implementation mm -hmm. but even still you know the laws of the land are the guiding factors what would you say about uh, the key policy regulations that we have set on anti-laundering or anti-money laundering uh, you know regime mm. I will revert to the POCAMLA because that is the law of the land when mm -hmm. it comes to money laundering and as I said it's a good law it just needs proper implementation right yes mm -hmm. yeah all right existing vulnerabilities i know we've touched on a couple of them mm -hmm. uh, but then again i'd want to imagine you know on a research perspective uh, statistics uh, there could be more than meets the eye if we're talking about uh, money laundering we'll definitely speak about terrorism radicalization we would not run away from uh, talking about crime we cannot run away from just looking at the fact that uh, you know even those ones that are in the game are the ones who are facilitating this the cartelism 
system that runs therein. So how prone are we to these uh, vulnerabilities? It's, it's a tongue twister, yeah? <laughs> vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. um, I would say our systems, if, if we were in a situation where we're able to cover these loopholes that I have mentioned earlier, mm. we will reduce our vulnerabilities. But you see, I think with money laundering, every time, and uh, as I said, criminals are very smart. Mm -hmm. So they will constantly find a loophole constantly right. so you come in and you say um there was the the proceeds of crime amendment act of 2021 which was seeking to to bring in lawyers as reporting institutions mm -hmm. so the moment you bring that in they will find another loophole because um i think the idea behind that was the fact that lawyers are the same are the people they tend to be the legal profession that uh, enables criminals to open now these shell corporations that enable them to launder the money that they, they're trying to launder. Mm -hmm. So if that uh, that arc, that bill passes, then they will come in and find another loophole mm -hmm. where they can be able to uh, circumvent the system even mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. So the issue is uh, we need to start thinking like criminals uh, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. So could we be having deficiencies in the policies that we have set on board and you know what are the most uh, you know crucial and notable challenges that are there as well in this fight? Um, I've alluded to a few. Yes, One is that mm -hmm. um, that Hospital declaration. And declaration yeah. yeah, that declaration, the, the October 2021 declaration. I envisage that that will be a big issue if it actually comes to into play. Mm. Then we have the growth of the digital uh, economy. We have um, use of cryptocurrencies, mm. especially, yeah. which is a whole other realm that is developing when it comes to money laundering. We've seen even um, even right now as Russia is, refu is receiving sanctions, mm. they're, we're seeing them move more into cryptocurrencies because of they're not able to trade in any other means. Mm. Yes. So rise of cryptocurrencies, then the use of mobile money, I, especially, I think, I can't remember the precise year, but the moment we had uh, mobile money in, Afghan if in Afghanistan, Afghanistan yeah. and India, we had a significant upside when it comes to drug trafficking mm -hmm. in Kenya mm -hmm. because money is moving even more freely. Then we also need to sort out our border issues with Somalia because that's a major entry point for majority of the illegal activity that is happening in the country. Mm -hmm. Yes. And at the level of the banks, uh, so to speak, at the level of these, uh, you know, institutions, uh, financial institutions that we have, how best can they come in handy to arrest this situation? Because like you have said, you know, it's ironical that uh, we could be looking at the country, but, uh, you know, the connections are way beyond the country. You will hear people speaking of the fact that they have friends in Nigeria they have never met. And, you know, they are able to conduct all these activities and someone gets their cut and you women dry you know via empesa via different banks and all that so how then do they come in to make sure that uh, you know in their very own institutions this ugly uh, you know activities of money laundering do not take place well actually that is already taken care of in the law okay what needs to be done is due diligence because under the proceeds of crime and anti-money laundering act these are uh, there's a provision for suspicious transactions where banks are supposed to report if there is a, a transaction that they suspect is tra is suspicious, mm -hmm. say an account has been empty and suddenly it has millions of shillings, mm -hmm. that is suspicious. Right. So ideally, they're supposed to report that to the Financial Reporting Center for investigation. So those systems are in place. Implementation, again, is where the issue comes in. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. So upon this knowledge, what is the way forward? Mm -hmm. uh, because we can't just be seated there and say that the laws are there, mm -hmm. but then again, they're not being followed, they're not being implemented. We might as well say that we have lost on this battle. No, we have not lost. Mm -hmm. And I have not given up. As an expert, I have not given oh, up. Yeah. Because you're, yeah. But we need to, first of all, do a lot of due diligence. And a major part of the due diligence that we need to do is gathering political goodwill. Mm -hmm. And the only way we gather political goodwill is this fight that we are constantly fighting against corruption. Mm -hmm. That's our biggest and our ultimate problem. If we're able to sort out corruption, majority of now these issues, even in terms of uh, get rich quick schemes, mm -hmm. we can deal with that. All right. Yes. Your parting shots as we come to a close, uh, because then we're here, it's happening. 
uh, but you remain positive and you keep researching on this and you know just trying to see how best uh, this can be put to rest yes yeah um i would say let's be patient especially for the youth let's be patient mm -hmm. let's do our due diligence we've seen our parents work from bottom up yeah yeah patience for In the this tough economic times and I, I mean, some will tell you that, yes, you know, you don't understand how your parents were able to take care of the seven of you while you're not even able to take care of this one of yours. Yes. So probably the difference in time is mm -hmm. one of the things that we might need to look at. And, and, and maybe that's what informs this, this, this young touch, you know, getting into this. Possibly we're in different economic times. Yeah. But if possibly we hadn't embraced this culture where... I, I see you, I see you have a nice dress, you have mm. nice shoes, and I don't, I don't know what you have done to get to the point that you are at. Yeah. But I need to have that patience to be able to understand that Linda has been working for five, ten years to be able to afford the lifestyle that she's living. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, and I think it's also a culture that we're getting even from our exposure to social media, which is a contributing factor, which is a major difference between uh, what the ages our parents were living in and the age that yeah. we're living in right now. Mm. Yes, the whole social media culture and the fact that we're even more exposed, which brings me back to the whole conversation about digital finance and digital technology and mm. the evolution mm -hmm. and what has that has done to influence money laundering. That's true. Yeah. Well, stay woke, they would say, because apparently <laughs> these options are here. Yes. So it is for you to decide whether you want to go that direction or not. And the dangers that come along with that equally are uh, probably way above uh, enjoying the proceeds, or so to speak. Thank you so much, Aida Gadoni, for speaking to us once again. I get to say this. Uh, Aida Gadoni <laughs> is a resident research fellow, strategic interest and transi transitional, transnational, transnational yes. yes, organized <laughs> crimes at Glossips. Oh, thank you so much once again. I look forward to have more and more of these conversations that are very crucial. And uh, the fact that, uh, you know, we're also having young ones uh, getting into understanding this, you know, in-depth understanding that could help us, formula, you know, come up with uh, policies and uh, strategies and ways of making sure that uh, the problems that bedevil us are then able to be put to rest. Once again, Asante, and uh, back to you. Thank you so much as well for keeping us company right from the word go. Then it's at this particular point that we have to close it, but we still have more, you know, set for you for the day. So make sure